Hello and welcome to a live after reading. I'm your host, Tim Niederreiter. And with me today is Trisha Copeland. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Tim. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. And despite technical difficulties earlier, it's always nice to have a new a new guest to chat with. And lucky me, I get a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, Trisha, uh, what sort of stuff do you write? Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your books. Yeah, I genre hop a little bit. So I write YA fantasy as well as some new adult um, fade to black romances. Mm. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, cool. Go on. Yeah, no, I was going to say, um, when my brain gets too filled with all the my fantastical world, I have to give it a rest and just write, you know, a sweet, happily ever after romance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I mean, especially because YA can get pretty, uh, pretty grim occasionally, right? I mean, I don't know what kind of you write, but sometimes it can be kind of dark. Yeah, and you know, I mean, it's fantasy, and not everybody can make it through all of those battles. So, and there's a lot of things and characters and world building going on. So, it can yeah. be a lot. <laughs> yeah, speaking as a fantasy author myself, I do, that's predominantly what I write. And yeah, there can be a lot there. And sometimes people have accused me of putting too much there personally. <laughs> but so I've gotten reviews to that effect of like, yeah, there's so much going on here and I just can't follow it. Ah, three stars, that kind of thing. That can be a bit of a bother. But m- mostly people have been receiving my work pretty well lately. I'm just kind of like, oh boy, is this too much? Because I like very weird settings and creatures and stuff. Fun. My editor usually pulls those out if I go too far. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's good to work with an editor, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't work with a, uh, an editor for, mo- for a lot of my books. Like, I work, I work at least a lot, not for that stage, right? You know, I do the right. copy edits and stuff. Okay. Yeah. But I don't have uh, the budget to do, like, to get them to afford for them to tell me that kind of thing. <laughs> so, so, okay. I just, yeah. to under- I just have to trust in a few first readers and that kind of thing, you know? And uh, yeah, not a lot of those either these days because. Well, your readers like that too, to be able to be beta readers and yeah, you know, in the process. So that's a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I still need to get a a team set up for that kind of thing. And what does that tell me, tell you about me? Because I've written, I have 20 some books out and I haven't, and I haven't got a beta team. Amazing. Maybe. Um, Yeah. I don't know. I don't have a huge beta team either. Um, yeah, it's it, they're hard to manage. I mm-hmm. I did it in the beginning, and it was it was really tough. So. Yeah, it it does strike me because I follow a few author tube, you know, YouTubers who write mm-hmm. and talk about their writing, and uh, author tubers, and a few, and a lot of them talk about beta readers. And I'm like, that just sounds like a nightmare having a bunch of beta readers running around, and you got to try to track them down and get their feedback and stuff, and it's a whole other job. <laughs> Right. And you have to really be able to trust because, and they have to be invested in your world, right? Or yeah. their their opinions are going to come from everywhere. <laughs> right. It's the same kind of thing with writing groups. Have you ever been in a writing group, like that kind of thing? I have not. I have talked to a lot of authors that have, but I think I just, yeah, it's a lot of time because you're reading their work as well as your work. And I work, work full time already. So <laughs> Same right more or less uh and the thing i've also noticed is that writing groups are kind of hit and miss right because if like like you said with the beta readers if they're not your the right reader for your book or you and you're not the reader, right reader for there then why are you giving feedback right i mean you don't need to i mean if i don't if somebody doesn't read sci-fi or fantasy they're not gonna want to read one of my books i can pretty confident that oh, that's the case <laughs> I, yeah, I actually was in, well, I'm doing an anthology right now and all the other authors read the other author's stories, which I have done several anthologies, but there wasn't this much like feedback from the other authors and my story got blasted. I was completely shocked. Um, and part of it, you know, it's hard to write a short story because it especially was coming out of my series. Like it was a like spinoff of my series. So, you know, I'm so ingrained in the series that I knew the series and it made total sense to me and my editor so ingrained, it made total sense to her. And so I did have to step back and look at it and say, okay, if I'm a newcomer to this world, would I get this? Would I be able to jump in and see what's going on in 5,000 words? Does that give me a complete story? So I did rework it some, but even so people were like assuming like, 
I, I, I talked about witches and angels and some demons and they were, and they were assuming some of the names were based on Greek mythology, but it had nothing to do with the story. They like, they made a lot of assumptions about what the witches and what the world was like when I hadn't even put that in there. Right. So I don't, yeah, I was kind of confused. So it was just, the feedback was all over the place. Too. So yeah, it's, it's hard. Names to walk that line. Yeah. Names especially can really, bother people especially other writers though is what i found i mean most of the time i don't find people complaining about my names when i in the in the regular reviews even though i have come up with some pretty byzantine style names some pretty baroque names for some characters in some fantasy novels especially my older ones weirdly enough like i and I have gotten I got like one piece of feedback of like there are just too many weird names in this book that I can't follow at all. But mostly people just don't worry about that. Like I know I don't worry about names when I read a fantasy book, right? I'm not like unless the name is something really out there and then it kinda of, like like something but that usually means it's more normal, right? And I have to notice it, or the names don't fit together, then it's kinda of weird. Right. Like, like if, I wouldn't if, assign if a meeting are, Go on. Yeah, I wouldn't assign a meaning to a name. Unless you told me the meaning within the book. I wouldn't assume it had some other meaning from some other place. Yeah. In 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 like in a not in a new fantasy world. And I yeah, I used the name Thanatos, which I I usually do assign names to characters that mean something. Like this was an evil character and Thanatos usually is associated with death and dying. Yep. So um but she are the person that was giving me feedback like jumped to this was a Greek mythology story when it had nothing to do with Greek mythology. Right. So, yeah, even though that is a and, Greek word, yeah, yeah. Right. So um so yeah, it was kind of interesting. Right. Yeah, that's that is kind of a, yeah, it, it frustrates me, especially because there's only so many words in the. I mean, when I've had gotten feedback like that, it frustrated me. You know, there's only so many words you can deal with in any in, in that exist in, on Earth anyway. They're easy to say. You know, humans we we have a lot. There's a lot of them, but it is probably a finite number of sounds we can make. You know, right? And I my really my vocabulary is more limited to like Western languages. You get me into like. <laughs> A Middle Eastern or an Asian language, and I I have trouble with pronunciations. So. I mean that makes sense, right? Because a lot of those are, especially when you get to East Asia, a lot of those languages are like, this is what the the, the, the spelling. If you're reading the English the anglicized version of the word, it doesn't. Especially in Chinese, it doesn't tell you what the word sounds like. Really, it has. It's just right. what they. It's just how they wrote the word in England at some point. Probably. I mean, it's wild. And then yeah. it just got handed down through the ages. And now, why does it? Why do they write the the ts or whatever sound and like make everything look? And it may, and it does make everything look kind of uh, what? Yeah, I mean, literally. I mean, I read a few books that were written in that style, right? They were translated, and it does make them feel more, you know, Oriental, I guess. But that's probably why the the the, set, the colonists did that. The people or the, the English translators would do that. They would say, "Okay, I mean, your name is whatever. We're going to write this name with a C sometimes, or a TS, or whatever." And it's like, yeah, and, and the and actual sound doesn't sound anything like either of those combinations. Right. I wrote an Aztec mythology book. It's it's more of a middle grade book, I guess. The character is age twelve, um, so it's a little bit younger YA, but. Um, yeah, and we included a lot of Aztec words because I wanted to feel really authentic, and I did a lot of research on it to make sure like the setting was correct and their society was correct and how the houses looked because I was um, and worked with an illustrator and they did some illustrations for the book and. Um, but I used a lot of the Aztec language words, <laughs> but when I talk about the book, it's really hard. Like I, before I start to talk about the book, I always have to go to the internet and like, listen to how this word is pronounced. And, and still I get them wrong because there's too many letters in there. And I shouldn't even talk because my real name is Polish and it has like all these C's and Z's all together. In it. So well, it's not like, I, <laughs> yes, right. I it's not. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, my name is pretty hard to say too, even for I mean, for English speakers, right? I mean, uh, not my first name, but my you know my last name, right. Niederreiter. That one, my website used to be timniederreiter.com, and that is 
not it was a no go. Most people aren't going to be able to spell that because the because there's some silent letters and stuff, you know. Right. And uh, yeah, even yeah, so even European languages have their problems with uh, people trying to read them or spell them. Too many consonants or too many vowels or something. <laughs> I bet that's true of actually most languages. It's it's funny, or maybe it's just the again the English vo- di- uh, the English uh, vo- uh, not vocabulary alphabet. Our alphabet might be the, the the issue, honestly, because how we spell those words, the you know how we spell words is ridiculous sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and well, and probably it's me too because I grew up. I mean, I had very little Spanish in high school, and I know no other languages. Where in Europe, like most of them, know multiple languages. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as as somebody who's been helping teach kids to read now, I'm like, wow. Even the most, even some pretty normal sounding words to me are difficult to read at first, which is just strange to me. I mean, because I was obviously, I was a pretty big reader when I was young. I say obviously because my audience knows, but I read a lot of books before I was even like, I, you know, a third grader or whatever. I'd written, I read a bunch of books that people find pseudo difficult at even in their, you know, teens sometimes. And, and now I'm I'm thinking like oh but people have re- like there's certain words that just having extra consonants together like you said actually can really trip people up especially when they don't you know and that's true of young kids and people who just don't know that word you know it's like how do you do that or the consonants are in unusual order right um so, you know if you could put the the d after the n that can be really confusing that kind of thing. I and E or restaurant was a word that I could not spell forever. <laughs> like I, just, I finally I got I could, restaurant. <laughs> I don't know if I can spell that one either, actually, because the, the, those the, just the, the 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 syllable in the middle with all the anyway. We are getting micro here, but it's really <laughs> funny to me that I mean, there's so much to just individual words, and I have. I mean, do, have you ever made up a like a fantasy language or a naming language for your books or? Do you just kind of play that by ear most of the time when you're coming up? With yeah, I play it by ear. I haven't made up a language. I mean, like I said, I used a lot of the Aztec language in that one book, but I, I took their words and yeah. the words that I used in the book, I put a glossary in the book so you could go back. And But it was really easy to get the context too, like a bowl or a dagger, mm-hmm. you know, the names of their gods and things like that. So. Yeah. So I'm going to gonna say... I had never heard of this one kind of plant before. And this book I've been reading, I, I talked about it on a recent show, uh, Thrum by Meg Smitherman. I th- yeah, yeah, that's right. So I was re- I'm reading this novella and there's this, there's this plant referred to in it. Uh, I think it's pronounced pothos, but it's like P-O-T-H-O-S. And I never heard of that kind of plant before. And I'm like, hmm, okay. Hmm. And, but that word comes up quite a bit because it's not just a plant. Uh, almost ever in this book which is you know that's fine but I, when i come back to it i'm like oh i forgot what that what, the, what does that word even mean because <laughs> there's no reference to it to having leaves or being you know, a cactus or whatever i don't know so, so is the plant is the plant magical or it's, it, it... it's probably an illusion in the context of the book because <laughs> they take the book takes place basically on an alien spaceship and most of the stuff in it is I don't know yet. I actually haven't finished the book yet. It's mostly, <laughs> it seems like it's mostly this, this stuff is either created out based on the, what the alien has learned of humanity or because we're talking like, you know, a Q from Star Trek space God type alien, probably not a traditional rubber mask alien, if that makes sense. <laughs> they can all, pre- they, they can, pre- or it's almost, almost like an elder being kind of thing from, from Lovecraft or one of those stories, you know, okay. mythos stuff, but also a lot friendlier, I guess. Well, that's good. <laughs> he's, he's, he's being accommodating. He's like, okay, you can yeah, hang out. Okay. We're going to, I'm going to, pre- you know, it's one of those, like, we present ourselves in a form that you will recognize and be able to, and it won't, you won't be scared of it necessarily. Right. The humans will be comfortable. Yeah. A form you will be comfortable <laughs> with. Exactly. Right. They they're not. Hopefully, they're not luring the characters in to kill them all. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I guess I'll find out. I almost have. I'm almost <laughs> toward the end of the book now. Okay, so we're just gonna see what good. happens. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, there's all there is that kind of hint of a potential threat, right? There's always is when you when there's a big mystery going on in the background, 
of like, what is this alien like, right? You can't look at its true form. How can you know if it, you can trust it at all, right? There you go. Yeah. They so, could kill, the author could kill everyone at the end of the book. Yeah, could happen. I don't think there are any sequels to this one, which is uh, itself pretty fun and refreshing. <laughs> that can be, yes. Can, I'm not saying that they need to kill everybody, but uh, but and if Meg does it, she could. I and mean, that's always an option <laughs> in a book like this. Though it's funny because I try to write series lately, and I wish I didn't have to write a series for, just to be to be a fantasy author, you know, on, an independent fantasy author these days. I feel like, yeah, I could write standalones, but then by the time I write a standalone, if it's long enough to be, say, an epic fantasy, which is my current kind of subgenre I'm trying to break into, if I write wrote an epic fantasy, I'd probably want to keep that world for at least one or one or more other books, right? Because it's so they get so complicated and deep. Right. I don't know about you. I get so invested in my characters. I don't want to stop living in that world with them. So that's usually how my books go. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I wish I could. I, that's the funny thing is I think I get into the worlds really quickly now. I get into my characters pretty quick now. But I don't want to stay for very long, really. I don't. I feel like I wear out my welcome by the end of, you know, I don't know, 200,000 words. Oh, that's a lot, though. Yeah, that's so like two, that's like two books, you know, for that's non- at least two books, or it could be three. Yeah, it can be three. I mean, it can be five. My last series was a series well, of novellas, but yeah. uh, and it was about that long. But then I'm like, I need a break. So after five books, I'm like, okay, I'm not I'm gonna take a break and say we're gonna leave it here for now because I just don't, I just didn't have the the juice to keep going with those characters, and I, I, I just think, and even though that book, that's that series has had legs, right? It could go anywhere, but it wasn't being picked up. So I figured I've given it a fair shake. Not that many people have read this, even though it is actually doing okay now, which is the part where I'm like, oh, did I move on too fast? You know? Well, I think sometimes you have to finish a series for it to be read more too. I noticed that my series that's complete gets a lot more traction than my series that's not complete yet. That's a good point. Yeah. I and I haven't finished many of the series I've started, which is probably my other big marketing flaw. <laughs> as far as that goes, right? I have so many open ended series right now because I don't feel like I didn't feel like writing the last book. Because maybe that's maybe that goes to what you were saying before, right? You know, you were saying you don't want to clo- you know you don't want to leave the characters. I'm like I want to take I want to travel around. I don't want to put the nail in the coffin, but I don't want to stay and just hang out with the same characters for more than a huge than a few books or at a time. Okay. So yeah, your series hopping sort of like I do with my romance and my fantasies. Yeah. But then but your mean, series hopping within the same genre. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I did series hop once I series hopped to a, or uh, yeah, I hopped to, to science fiction or, or science fantasy. And that book is way different, but it is at least in a lot of ways. People will tell me it's fantasy. I thought it was science fiction when I was writing it. Anyway. Uh, that one is, but that one's also my longest novel. So I never wrote a sequel to it or currently my longest, but probably won't be after I finish this current book. <laughs> well, hard sci-fi people have definite rules about what is sci-fi and what is not sci-fi. Well, it's definitely yeah. hard sci-fi, but I'm not a, I w- I've never claimed this book was hard sci-fi. Let me put it that way. It's, it takes place in the universe with fictional physics. So. Okay. There's like, so there's, it can't be sci-fi yeah. according to many sci-fi people. Right. I guess that's true. I just like there's no magic in it. That's to me that makes it more sci-fi feeling, and it has spaceships and stuff, but it doesn't have, I don't know, the usual stuff. Anyway, I, I've explained it many times. No, the- no, but I live yeah. with the person who is very like particular about their sci-fi, so it has to be something that could happen or technology that could happen based on current technology. So yeah, that that's definitely the hard sci-fi thing. But there's right. a lot of sci-fi like Star Wars, and that's more where I was leaning. Some people will yeah. say Star Wars isn't sci-fi. That's why I'm like, okay, science fantasy. That tends to fit what I do better when I have a spaceship in my story. Right. Um, anyway, so Trisha, we got you, you write across age categories too. I think that's interesting. I haven't. I wrote when I was younger. I wrote a few books. I think might be YA, but I didn't. I haven't written any of those since I really. Since I graduated from college, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I thought, okay, I'm I'm a young guy. I'd written four or five books since before I graduated college, but uh, I thought, okay, I'll try to write for younger readers because I know what it was like to be a younger person than I am now, right? So I'd write down a little bit, 
And then I, and then about about when I turned twenty five, I actually started writing up, basically, and I st- or writing about the same age as myself for my main characters, because I don't, I mean, and I can write older sometimes, but I find it challenging, right? Because I don't have that much experience. I didn't have that much experience back then. Uh, yeah, but when you go back to write, uh, just to turn this into a question, because I am. I guess semi interviewing you uh, <laughs> uh, and not just monologuing about myself. Uh, yeah. When you approach writing a, a younger character, how do you deal with, uh, this is one of my issues really is how do you deal with the history of say a teenage character in their, you know, their personal history and stuff is so short. It feels to me. And then, and it's not like, it feels to me like they're still in the backstory part of the story. Now that I've gotten used to writing adult characters. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. I feel like I don't know enough about them because they don't know much about, that much about themselves either, right? There's not that much there, but there's also all, still plenty. Obviously, a lot of people do write why. How do you do it? Well, and I guess I, I was interviewing with someone else and they said, oh, you heaped way too much on that character. So, <laughs> so in my Kingdom Journal series, the, it starts out with a character who's half vampire and half witch. Mm-hmm. And this hybrid being is forbidden by both the witches and the vampires. So, and her mother is the chancellor of the vampires. So she has to hide the fact that she has, or is half witch. She can't let anybody know this or she would be taken and killed. So she has that problem on top of the problem that her mother wants her to be integrated in a human society. So when she goes to human high school, she has to pretend to be a human and not be a vampire or a witch. (laughs) And then on top of that, her, She's never known her father, so her mother's a vampire, so obviously her father would be a witch, but we don't know who he is. Her mother is searching for someone, but she doesn't know whether it's her father or some other unknown person being vampire witch, right? And so she's trying to figure out all these things in her life that she are just big question marks hanging above you know, what do I do next? Where do I go? Where do I fit in? Who am I really? Where do I want to be? which society do I want to belong to in the end? Um, so that's a lot for a 17 year old, I think. Oh, absolutely. Cause you can heap all the other 17 year old stuff on top of that. Right. I mean, right. <laughs> and I guess that, I mean, that, that does add plenty of conflict and that's all that stuff is kind of independent of her personality and her actual life as far as she's lived it. Right. All that stuff is like, yeah, okay. You're raised by the vampire mother. So, that comes with all this baggage and the, the origin, you know, the actual lineage comes with a bunch of baggage too. Right. So that makes sense. Right. Right. You yeah. Know. So. That's a good, that's a good way to think about it. Cause yeah. But I, because I, I, at one point I was very intensely focused. This was a while ago. I don't, I think I grew out of it intensely focused on writing characters that were very normal. I don't know why I thought they should fit into their world. I guess I wanted to write fantasy characters that were kind of normal to their setting. So they weren't exceptional. Right, they weren't different, and I don't know if I published any of those books. Now that I think about it, there were there were a lot. There are a lot of unpublished books in my trunk, so to speak, and they are because it's hard to write a character that doesn't feel like they have anything special going on. If because if I, as the author, approach it that way, right? This is the kind of what I learned. I think if I, as the author, approach the character as not being special they're not going to be special because that's what I'm going to shoot for kind of thing. As opposed to, they don't have any like special lineage or powers or whatever. Like they're not half vampire, half witch or something, but they can still be special all because people are different from each other. People are very unique in their, by their very nature. Right. Well, I think you can show a lot of different, you know, I mean, character, I mean, humans, all humans, I think are special. We all have something that makes us unique or special. You know, we may be more perseverant we may or stubborn or uh, more resilient or we may you know have more empathy or we may you know have certain things we you know just are animal we're more drawn to animals and we can help pets or you know there's so many things and there's so many different things you challenges you can put in front of their characters so that you can show their unique characteristics and personalities and traits and either showing them growing in some of those traits or show them, you know, just helping other people with those traits. So I think even for a normal quote unquote human, um, (laughs) which is what you have to do in like contemporary romance or contemporary 
things. You yeah, you don't have you can't make them a vampire and just normal. That's not allowed in that in, genre, no. Right in that genre, so you know what. And that, I actually tr- struggle with romance sometimes that way. I'm like, oh, this is too boring. <laughs> like, <laughs> how can I make this more interesting? But, um, but yeah, I mean, just normal life situations are, are conflicts and trials and tribulations. That makes sense. You know, and there's also, and it doesn't often be like weird history or whatever from the like stuff they've been through or done. Cause that's what's what, there's all these common kind of, depending on your genre, there's all these common levers you can, or jobs you can adjust like like the like if you're right like the action movie right like the classic 80s action movies it's like military ex-military you know that kind of thing like you just it's like the knob you can flip for the protagonist's background right <laughs> in, a, in a schwarzenegger movie for example or something like that you know it's like are they current i mean no predator is what just what popped in my head for some reason i don't care anyway um but i i find that yeah i mean what you said is exactly correct i think is exactly true that people have there's a lot more to people in just every possible way almost than you can even put on a page in a book so it's kind of a silly question now that i think about it i got my face silly questions whatever that uh is like is there enough about any character to write about well yeah probably you know i mean if you dig into them probably true Depending on what challenge you give them. I mean, you know, you're, if you write about a writer, do they have writer's block? Do they, you know, have some other you know, either mental or physical challenge that they can't write their story? Or there's so many challenges that you could put in front of a writer. Yeah. So, yeah, you have to be creative. Yeah, I guess I wasn't thinking. I, I'm thinking of like the most, I don't know, people who even, even the poor person who comes off as the most like baseline kind of. I, I don't want to say milk toast, but that's the word that popped into my head. You know, kind of the most normal person who has the least spe- special interest in their lives. I mean, there's plenty there, right? There's plenty of person there. <laughs> yeah. The yeah, amount I of mean, person as anyone else, really. What insecurities and, and do the they have? Yeah, exactly. Right. How did they grow up? You know, where do they fit in society? What challenges do they have day yeah. to day? You know, it doesn't have to be like, you know. I need to take over the world and save the world. <laughs> it can yep. be, I need to help the little elderly lady that lives next to me. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's, that's why I'm like, yeah, they was so wrong headed to me back then. Right. When I was saying I have to write normal characters just to get a feel for them because that was the, I mean, then it's like, I'm trying to write the guy from, I mean, I wasn't trying to do this. Right. But you know, uh, the movie stranger than fiction with Will Ferrell. Uh, I, I think maybe where he's yeah, a I've character. It, he's yeah. a character in a book that's being written, but he's like an ultra boring person because he's written to be that way in the in the beginning of the book that he is a character in. Um, and he and yeah, and it is we it's a weird meta thing, but that does remind. That's what this reminds me of the most, honestly. Is he's kind of because he's like an insurance guy, I think, or yeah, he's like an insurance, or yeah, I think he's an insurance uh, salesman or something, whatever. Uh, he does some some really kind of some job people kind of see as boring, right? Some like oh yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, it's it's it ends up though that he has to change, right? But he changes and he starts noticing that he's a character in a book. But that's not that that's just a meta twist where he's literally a character who's created to be boring in the first place somehow, and yet he exists in the real world <laughs> in that in the context of that movie, which is kind of amusing, I guess. I guess there's something about boredom, though. Boredom is a useful tool, but being bored of your character seems like it's not, it's not, it's a no-go, honestly. Would you say so? Right, yeah. I mean, yeah, you don't want to be bored of your character. And that's usually, like, if I'm writing and I'm tired of my character, I'm like, oh, this is a bad sign. Because obviously, if I'm bored of my character, my readers are definitely going to be bored of my character. So, um, yeah, whether you put a new challenge for them or you, you know usually just fling some horrible thing that happens in there. (laughs) Oh yeah. Speaking of horrible things. (laughs) Uh, No. um, When does, uh, have you ever had this happen to you? It's definitely happened to me where you you feel like you went too fast into the story. And that, I mean, this has happened to me like once in one or two books that are unfinished. Let me put it that way. Because it's a killer for me. I felt like, okay, I went too quickly. I have 50,000 words all of a sudden. 
and now I don't know where, what to do, and I've got to put it on the shelf for at least a little while and think about it kind of thing because I just don't know where to go, right? I feel like – or there's too much going on almost. It's the opposite of the, the problem of being bored, right? It's like I'm not bored of this, but I feel like I went off the rails somewhere, you know? <laughs> that ever happened? Yeah, before? you um, – well, I mean, like I was talking about my short story, I yeah. think – you know, in my mind, it was like a complete story and good, but nobody else saw the plot line in it at all. So obviously I needed to work on it a little bit. Um, but I usually, before I write my book, I always know like where I'm beginning, where I'm in, when I want my characters to end. And I usually know like the major plot points yep. and then I fill them in in between. So that makes at least, right. So I don't do a lot of like complex or detailed outlining but at least i have that structure there right um but the last book i wrote my editor came back um after halfway through the book she was like i can't even read this anymore i'm so bored and i was like oof, oof. and it was like she was like rewrite the first 10 chapters and that was half the book and i was like yeah. okay ouch she was like i got bored you need to rewrite this and i mean i was just living in my character's head I guess doing day to day things and didn't throw enough challenges at them or and, and a YA book sometimes needs to be a little bit faster paced and right. you know, you need to have more of that action in there. So yeah, I, I had to do some major reworking with that. Yeah. A little, uh, a little bit too low on the, on the things happening or the conflict. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. Rather than like internal drama or, you know, just, care with relationships and things like that especially yeah. in a fantasy you want you want oh, absolutely. <laughs> some stuff's got to go down in fantasy right? right i mean it's one of the things that bothers me the most about some of the big dogs in the genre though i mean honestly uh in epic fantasy specifically i mean because again that's the genre i'm currently writing in that's what i always think about and also it's kind of the biggest genre right the biggest subcategory of fantasy right now except maybe ya i actually don't know where ya falls on that but, well, YA could be epic fantasy too. So, yeah, it, you know, yeah, you exactly. put, which bucket exactly. are you putting things in? Yeah. But, and, and a lot of them are. A lot of the big ones are both, right? But when I look at something like uh, what a lot of people will swear is a classic, something like The Wheel of Time, and I did read the first few Wheel of Time books, and I thought, this is getting tough. You know, it's. Oh boy. Yes, yeah, my dog is. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the dog is like no enough podcasting <laughs> yes <laughs> Sorry. well don't don't worry about it but okay. uh, never mind i was just ranting about robert jordan you know real time but no but he, he at times would do things where he'd like skip the action sequence right he'd skip that part and then we'd learn about it later like there's some, oh and that so was you're the, like telling the, yeah you're it's like telling instead of showing yeah very shakespeare is the messenger scene kind of thing or mm -hmm. like the end of the hobbit's a good example of this actually done pretty well because you know bilbo gets knocked out spoiler or before the final battle in the hobbit and in the book we just learn what happened later but see the thing about that that's actually kind of smart is he wouldn't have had the perspective to see the battle Right. So we wouldn't learn about the battle like a battle. We'd learn about it like I'm a terrified little guy who's trying not to get crushed, crushed. And then we'd have to learn what actually happened later, too. So it's really just a good way to speed things up kind of thing. Just give a, I mean, not good way, but it's it's how Tolkien saw yeah, to yeah. get past the part where he's just terrified. Because this book wasn't about being scared, really. I mean, obviously, this is a fantasy book he wrote for probably middle grade readers, honestly, at the time. Uh yeah. So anyway, that, I loved The Hobbit when I was a kid, and I thought, and it never occurred to me that the battle scene at the end was not even really experienced in real time, right? That wasn't the. But Bilbo is not a Bilbo is not a warrior. He's not really going to do much in this battle, and again, he can't see it either because if he's actually fighting in it, right. You read those books much earlier than me. I read them like college age. Oh no, that was my favorite book when I was a kindergartner. The Hobbit. Yeah. Wow. My my parents had read it to me at that point. I wasn't reading it myself, okay. but I did. I did read it quite young. <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't start reading fantasy probably like till third or fourth grade. I think. Okay. Like the. Did you know the series Frank Baum series that was like a thirteen book series, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, and 
and all they had like one book that was the Tin Man, and another book was all the different characters. That was See, my I, I knew that was a series. I didn't read that one. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I got it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I've heard lots of good things about Oz. I didn't realize they were books until I was an adult. I just saw the movie. Okay. <laughs> uh, which is probably a shame, right? I mean, it seems like that's well regarded, and yeah, it's just miss that one you know and sometimes and maybe yeah um sometimes and it's it's funny because that's the other thing about just the world in general right and i i don't know why i'm saying this because everybody should know this you definitely know what i'm pretty sure but there's so much out there right like we've been talking about there's so much out there in the world it's like yeah i don't i've never even read that book and it's a it's a classic that series is a, is a fantasy cornerstone in a lot of ways too probably Right. Yeah. Well, but it's definitely a ch- child's book. I mean, yeah. it's not an adult book. Uh, it's a, it's yeah, that's a good point. But it's like it's foundational probably for tons of people and I got by without ever knowing it basically. <laughs> you know, and because that's how big the world is and that's how much stuff's in it. Right. And I think you know, it depends on what your parents were looking at or what they saw or what they found or what they were interested in too. So. Yeah, I think I think I read the Wrinkle in Time, a Wrinkle in Time when I was young, and that was really difficult for me mm-hmm. at first. And I think that might be a similar kind of category to uh, Wizard of Oz, actually. Maybe that series. I mean, series, except it's like what my parents were interested in, right? Because it's got all this physics stuff in it, and both my parents are physics professors. So okay. yeah, they t- they wanted like th- th- there's like tesseracts and stuff in it, so it's like a little bit sci-fi, but it's definitely fantasy kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, and it could have been people's personality too. Like my sister was really into Narnia, and it was really popular then. And but I didn't want to read it because I didn't want to read what was popular. So ah, <laughs> maybe, okay. like, maybe that's why I chose like um, Dorothy because it was like an older series that wasn't like the end thing right now. So oh, that makes sense. I mean, I could see that. that that's the kind of thing I might do as well when I was younger. Yeah. I mean, I, actually, I still think I still do. Like, I mean, I haven't read all the uh, all the mythos stories that are probably decent that came out after H.P. Lovecraft and his silliness, you know, after he created the that universe or mythos rather. But well, him and, his, and a bunch of his his editor and so on. But I went back to a book that's actually kind of it's it's a dying Earth novel, right? It's from like eight, 1919, I think. Oh, wow. it's, it's a dying earth novel, so it's set in the far future. And by this, we mean like after the sun has gone out, gone out, and there's no light left oh, on okay. Earth, and humanity is just surviving in these crazy, big mega structure things. <laughs> and there's, but there's, oh, but even though, the, but it's a horror. It's like very scary because, yeah, of course the sun's gone out, so of course there's no light, and people are just in, do, you know. But there's all these crazy science fiction concepts in there, mixed with the fact that there's also monsters and magic and stuff. It's like. <laughs> People didn't have genres back then the way we do now, you know, and that's why I went back to it. It's called The Nightland by uh, okay. uh, William Hope Hodgkins, I think. Uh, yeah. And I've I've only read about 20% of it because it's really hard to read it. It's not written like a pulp novel. It's not easy to read, <laughs> which is uh, maybe the biggest problem with the book, actually. But uh, it's so circuitous to say anything. That's just how we wrote oh, okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Right. A lot, a lot of prose. Just, but the concept, that's probably why it didn't catch on and become one, like a classic, like, mm-hmm. like Tolkien or the wizard of Oz or, or Lovecraft, you know, I mean, even Lovecraft, even Lovecraft is not as hard to read as this book. So things that put that in perspective, <laughs> uh, anyway, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, Trisha, it's been good talking your ear off. <laughs> Anything else you want to talk about quick here? I mean, I'm running out of time for my... I learned a lot. Yeah, this is super fun. Oh, good. I'm glad well, I'm glad you had a good time. What Remind people where they can find your books and what they should be looking for from you. Right. So my website is Trisha Copeland, T-R-I-C-I-A-C-O-P-E-L-A-N-D dot com. And you can go there. I have two free short stories. Um right click at the top I, you can get a fantasy or a romance depending on like what you want to read and you can get on my newsletter that way and hear all my updates fantastic trisha this has been a lot of fun and as for me you can find my podcast feed this podcast feed rather on libsyn on the, the just search live after reading libsyn feed and you'll find it uh i know i need to have a link but 
I'm going to put one on the website. My website is timneederwriter.com. That's pronounced, that's spelled T I M N E E D W R O A W R I T E R.com. So need a writer. That's how you say my name, but I spelled it as words because it's easier for people to remember. I hope. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. I'll talk to you again next week. Thanks, Tim. Bye. Thanks so much, Trisha. Bye bye.